So my name is Jake Watson. Uh, my the job title is uh, Principal Data Engineer, uh, and my coffee is a, is Bourgeois Espresso. Welcome back to the MLOps community. I am your host Dimitri Os, and hoping that you are having a magical day full of surprises and beautiful surprises at that. Oh, stop the tape before we get into this next episode. I want to tell you about our virtual conference that's coming up on February 15th and February 22nd. We did it two Thursdays in a row this year because we wanted to make sure that the maximum amount of people could come for each day since the lineup is just looking absolutely incredible. As you know, we do. Let me name a few of the guests that we've got coming because whew, it is worth talking about. We've got Jason Louis, we've got Shreya Shankar, we've got Dhruv, who is product applied AI at Uber. We've got Cameron R Wolf, who's got an incredible podcast and he's director of AI at Rebuy Engine. We've got Lauren Lockridge, who is working at Google, also doing some product stuff. Oh, why is there so many product people here? Funny you should ask that because we've got a whole AI product owners track along with an engineering track. And then as we like to, we've got some hands-on workshops too. Let me just tell you some of these other names just for a moment, you know, because we've got them coming and it is really cool. I haven't named any of the keynotes yet either, by the way, go and check them out on your own. If you want, just go to home.mlops.community and you'll see. But we've got Tunji, who's the lead researcher on the Deep Speed project at Microsoft. We've got Holden, who is the open source engineer at Netflix. We've got Kai, who's leading the AI platform at Uber. You may have heard of it. It's called Michelangelo. Oh my gosh. We've got Fazan, who's product manager at LinkedIn. Jerry Louis, who created Good old Llama Index. Oh, he's coming. We've got Matt Sharp, friend of the pod. Shreya Rajpal, the creator and CEO of Guardrails. Oh my gosh, the list goes on. There's 70 plus people that will be with us at this conference. So I hope to see you there. And now let's get into this podcast. Today, we're talking with Jake all about data platforms. I love his articles. I'm going to just come right out and say it. I'm a huge fan of what he's done when it comes to building data platforms and what you need to know as you are building out your data platforms. He's gone deep into everything from the architecture, how you can add and maximize value, and then all the pieces that come with the data platform that coincidentally or not so coincidentally have a lot of overlap when it comes to your ML platform. So these are things like data ops, data modeling, data pipelines, oh my God, data transformation, data quality, data governance. Can I say data one more time? <laughs> Let me try and sneak that in there. Data security, obviously, and organizational pieces like just people, teams, hierarchy of teams, and how you make that happen. So this conversation centered around all of these posts that he's done and things that he's been seeing out in the wild and what has been most effective. I almost said effectful. Pretty sure that's not a word. If what has been the most effective as he's been out there doing his thing as the principal data engineer. Hope you enjoy. And if you can do one thing, and one thing only, we would love it if you share this podcast with one friend of yours. Talk to you soon. Well, Jake, it's a pleasure to have you on here. I am very excited because we get to talk all about the data platform today, how that interfaces with ML platforms, really what I am calling 2024 the year of the data engineer, which feels like they were a little bit forgotten in 2023. I don't know if you felt that too, but the AI hype and the LLMs hype, it made people think that like these jobs were almost obsolete, I think. And those that have been in the pits digging trenches knew that they weren't going anywhere. If anything, they were going to get more valuable. And so I've been seeing a ton of demand in the community for 
topics like this that are going to help upskill and get people that even if they are further down the line on their LLM journey, they still need that good old data. They need it to be transformed. They need it to be modeled correctly. And so who better to talk to than you about all this good stuff? Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm, happy. I'm looking forward to a fun chat, uh, just getting into the weeds. Yeah, I definitely feel like we did feel that the, the hype was all consuming, but now I'm starting to see increasingly people asking me, how do I get this element thing working at scale and with our data, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah. Exactly. So let's give everyone a bit of a uh, background on you. I know you from your blog and your Substack, if you want to, whatever, like newsletter, blog, whatever Substack is these days. Yeah. And the work that you've done on there, you have super comprehensive blog posts on how to build data platforms, the reasons for different components. I want to get into all of that, but I think it's worth talking to people about what you do day in, day out. Yeah, that's uh, absolutely fine. My title is Principal Data Engineer. I work for the Oakland Group, who is a data consultancy. My, yeah, my, even my title can be a bit misleading in that respect, as uh, I, you could say simply data consultant, as I tend to go work through a variety of, as you've usually starting with the client when they haven't even got anything built and it's a blank sheet of paper. So trying to architect, design that, gather requirements, uh, making uh, sure that, that they're going on the right path. Okay, so you wrote a really good blog post that I want to dive into that is all about the data platform foundations. And I'm wondering what inspired you to write that post? Um, I might have described it a little, a might, a little bit uh, in my intro post when I did it, which was basically data platforms can end up being, you know, dozens of different elements and uh, different and lots of talking with lots of different people as well. So you usually need a, a really large support network in your company to make it stand, uh, make, to get a, a platform built and keep supporting it as well and maintainable, which can be a whole different kettle of fish. It's quite, it can be quite easy to build a POC and another total thing to actually keep it running and in production as well. So I wanted to sort of like get that across about all the different parts. Um, and also try to explain there's lots of different varieties as well as not just your uh, modern data stack, but might have 20 different vendors all attached to it, which is, I know is a gross overwhelming thing, but it might just be a database doing some transformations, taking, taking, some, taking some data, transforming it, and then doing some outputs on that. Uh, and getting some insights from that. And it can be any web, it can be something as simple as that, or it can be something very complex where you got your Ubers, your Airbnbs, where you're building your own custom pieces of software to do things that no one else is doing in the industry. Yeah, so one thing that I really liked is how you basically showed both sides of the spectrum. And you said, look, here is what it can be if it is the simplest of the simple. And maybe there's a one person band that is trying to upkeep this whole platform. And then here's what it can look like in the most messy of situations. And so I, in your day to day, what's more common? What do you feel like you're seeing a lot of as far as patterns when it comes to the platform? Uh, it's somewhere in between. So as I mentioned, I work with quite a lot of um, enterprises that are probably, that might, that, right, that, uh, that can either be starting the journey or they might be quite far along on the journey. It, it, so it can vary. They usually got a couple of people on their data team. So it's rarely just one or two, but I have worked with those sort of, with those team, with those people. And also sometimes people that don't even have a data team yet or, and they're still trying to figure out how they can, how they can use all this, uh, how can they actually get, you know, make some data driven insights all, all the way to sort of like large, large 50 100 man teams on uh that have like lots of different microservices going along where they're pumping data from here and there and everywhere it's sort of like everything in between so i i'd, I'd say i was trying to say the average one i suppose the average data team might will be just classic two pizza team it's sort of like it, it can be difficult it's quite it's 
it can be not too bad to scale to that. It gets quite difficult to actually scale beyond that because you then have to start to place it onto teams and then it start, and then you have to have another level of hierarchy on that. Uh, and then you need to sort of like think about maybe you need to split up parts of your platform so each, so different teams can well, like work autonomously, autonomously at speed as well. You're starting to almost get into sort of like the data fabric, data mesh sort of landscape. So it can be quite difficult to move on from there. And some people just sort of like, oh, I'll just build another data silo and deal with it that way. And one thing that is clear to me is that you talk about how there is that data mesh that's coming up you also speak about like the organizational side of things right what you're talking about right there is very much it's not a problem so much scaling on the side of the technology it's more how are we going to have our teams be responsible for the data platform now what are we going to look at as far as a hierarchy of the people that are working on the data teams. Are there ways that you've seen this be successful? I mean, I know data mesh is a buzzword. It feels like something I've seen people talk about how data mesh is dead in 2024 and it was very lofty or is a very lofty goal. I don't know if it really caught on as much as people were hoping for, unless you have other thoughts on that. I would love to get your take on that, but as far as the organizational side of things and how people can architect that, have you seen success in different patterns there? Um, I'd, I'd say there's been a couple of success stories, but it, it, it is, as you say, it's probably been few and far, far between than people expected. I think it does come back to the people element that people usually when it came to data mesh because they have people issues. Uh, but people issues to solve are quite hard so it will take a few years for them to solve that so um it's usually people that have actually uh that have already been on the data mesh track but didn't quite realize it at the time like um I was working in one large uh public sector organization that were almost doing sort of the data mesh but, but didn't realize they were doing it where they were having for each of their uh their, their lines of business where they were building their own platforms and uh, organizations with like a central uh, governance plane underneath and uh, managing all uh, data governance and billing. So I think a couple of organizations were already on the path but didn't realize it. But I think it's I think it's going to be a slow burn and it doesn't it doesn't fit a lot of organizations as well. Yeah, I think you need to be uh, you need to be a large organization to truly benefit. I mean, you need to be uh, highly distributed by nature. So if you're a company that's globalized and has lots of offices in lots of different countries and uh, or, or companies like insurance firms that are by nature very split up, you know, you've got your home insurance, your car insurance, and they'll be having, and they may have their own, each have their own data teams, then it can make more sense there if, um, um, as opposed to someone that already has a centralized, somewhat working well, data team already and doesn't need to go too much in that they might like and, and there is some things you can do sort of that are on the sort of like on the way to a data mesh i mean it comes back to that there's the classic data mart modeling thing that's been around since the 80s uh uh-huh. you know with splitting up your warehouse by domain uh, and that can get you a long way towards a lot of your pains to solve in terms of uh, in terms of that, it won't be like a fully distributed system like a data mesh. So it won't have like separate DevOps systems, which might still mean you can only scale so far with a data map structure. So if you are hitting, so you might want to explore that and see if you're still hitting the pains with that before trying other methods as well. And there's so many places that I want to take this. One is really along the lines of different structures for the the data platform are there design patterns that you have seen that have worked out well and are easy-ish to implement or that have been useful and it's almost like your go-to recommendation so i've been working a lot in the lake house and um i've been 
a quite a, I've been quite a big fan of what uh, I think Web Databricks called the medallion architecture. Um, it's also been adopted by many people who are streaming. And like you'd see, it, I've seen it a bit with people that are building Flink. If you've come across uh -huh. the, the the stream processing library, which can do uh, also like Spark can do batch and real time streaming. Uh, and that can reduce the sort of like overhead and amount to a learn if you want to do both batch and real time. I'm starting to see more and more people slowly wanting to have stream streaming because they start because their users are starting to demand real time updates and sort of like notifications. You know, they've been using those Uber apps and Netflix and getting notifications in real time and says, I want our company to have a bit of that too and start demanding it to their data team. So they've got to start figuring out how do we get real time? And one of the easy ways is to get good enough um, streaming is through something that can offer both batch and real time, like uh, like Databricks and Snowflake. I know I've been offering it too. I'm not going to try and be too much of a uh, shrill to um, what are the <laughs> yeah. other. Yeah. Actually, one thing, I w it's funny you mentioned that because one thing that I was talking to a friend about the other day was how so many companies will start with one, be it Snowflake, and then they kind of hit the maximum that Snowflake can handle. And then they'll have to go to data bricks for a data lake. And so they end up paying both of them millions of dollars. And they, they're they like, there's got to be a better way than this. And it's like, we're using them both. We can't figure this out. Um, I mean, I can't. I mean, it differs from each company, so I can't offer, like, say, a silver bullet on that and that thing. I know there is a cost implication. With reason both, they can cost a lot of money at scale, which means some people start moving back into open source. It's it, uh, which is probably a lot of reason why the likes of Netflix and Airbnb, and I think we had a recent blog about Instacart who moved some of their stuff back from managed services to uh, run it, running themselves so they can save a lot of costs. Like I think they moved from AWS Kinesis to um, Kafka on Kubernetes, for example, to save. But, you know, because once you start running those servers and then paying an overhead on top of that for that managed services, it can start, those managed services extra costs can start to add up to actually a number of engineers that you can just hire to do to run that service itself but um yeah i don't know how often that sort of like comes up in terms of um they they tend to be like um big high maturity companies that can sort of do that sort of thing so one piece that you have on the data platforms that is almost like another thing that i feel like a lot of people talk about incessantly is the data modeling piece and how important it is that you get that right for the rest of the downstream effects, right? Can you talk a bit about how you see that? Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a tricky one with data modeling because um, it comes back to that. You, you're trying to get stuff done as quickly as possible. So it's one of those things that can be left on the wayside until it becomes a massive problem. And then it becomes absolute pain to sort later. It's hard. It, it, I think the one problem is at the moment is there's no one golden data model to use. Every every organization will have something slightly different. All might have multiple data models in that where, for example, with machine learning, it's classically you want a one big table so you can put that into a matrix and pass that into uh, scikit-learn or PyTorch or TensorFlow. But say for business intelligence, Power BI and Tableau prefer star schema, Kimball, dimensional modeling with facts and tables. So you might end up running multiple things. Uh, and and then and then you might be doing log analytics, which is sort of like it's all in JSON and Elasticsearch and MongoDB. So you, you can end up with like multiple different models and, and that can make it hard to sort of like make a single source of truth on that um, to mesh that all together so i wouldn't say i have a multiple but but be flexible don't try so you might i find it works better if people are a bit more flexible and not try and have one golden type of data 
modeling technique of saying, oh, I have, everything has to be Kindle, everything has to be one big table. You, you, you're going to find you might have to be flexible there and sort of like fit it best to your use cases and tooling that you're using is probably the best bet I've got is the best advice I can offer on that one, really. Yeah, and then how do you deal with the sprawl that inevitably comes from that, right? With with that, there's, it, I think there has been an increasing call to bring back the good old days of enterprise uh, modeling, which is more, um, it's sort of like, a, it's, it's escape for me, is the uh, conceptual modeling. Uh, um, which is sort of like getting back to uh, what is a customer, what is a product, and can we possibly have a golden data set for customer and product if purpose, which is oh, a okay. long and hard road to go down. Yeah. Hey everyone, my name is Aparna, founder of Arise, and the best way to stay up to date with MLOps is by subscribing to this podcast. And another problem with that is conceptual modeling was born in the 80s. So back in the days of water roll and, the pe- and you'll find that a lot of the people that preach the good word of conceptual modeling are still doing waterfall. So there needs to be a bit of give and take where you need to take conceptual modeling into the days of cloud and agile where you're trying to split up the work so it doesn't become, I'm going to spend three years just to make one golden customer table and work out what the hell a customer is. Um, and also, But also not turn it into a, a mess of a sprawl where we're never going to work it out, we don't care, and now we're just going to make 50 versions of the customer table and no one knows actually how many customers we have in uh, our company. So it's, it's trying to find that balance so you can bring the li- fast, you can bring bring some value, but you might find that you have to make compromises in that. Yeah, and one other piece that you talk about a bit is the data quality and how basically you're making trade-offs when you are dealing with all these different kinds of data models. Inevitably, I think you're going to have to say, how can we keep the data quality high and have that integrity in our data modeling? I, I think I've, I've, I've read a few couple of people that say you can solve everything with just enough tests um i i'm a, I'm a, I'm a little bit skeptical of that approach there's there's always more potential tests you can write because you, it's very rare you have 100 percent coverage because data because data quality tests are are qu- queries against your data warehouse and if you're using the likes of data bricks and snowflake you'll get charged per query so the more data quality tests you make, the more it will cost you, not to take in all the maintenance costs and all that. So data quality is kind of it is sort of like linked to classic technical debt in software engineering, where the more the debt accrues, the harder it can be to make changes because you know that if you make any changes, you can introduce data quality issues. And you need data quality tests to sort of give you some confidence in that. So I know it's being called by like the likes of Monte Carlo sort of like data debt, where it um, the more data debt you accrue, the harder it is to sort of like change at pace in an ag- in an agile manner. So there is that balance of uh, data quality can cost you a lot of money to do right. But it can also cost you not to do it because you're not changing and delivering value for the business and get it and uh, and the more value you give, the better your company's going to be. And so you break down a lot of different pieces when it comes to the data platform, and especially in these different blog posts, you go in depth on all these different pieces, right? And is there a hierarchy that you feel like you can't get to be it? data quality before you have data modeling done or you can't worry about your data transformations or is it all uh, weighted and valued equally how do you look at that type of thing as you're building out your data platform and you're trying to make it uh you're trying to build for the future too it really depends on how fast you want to move and deliver value like if you're doing a quick and dirty poc slash mvp depending on which terms you uh um, prefer, um, then you might not concentrate too much on getting modeling. You're just trying to prove a thing can work. 
and will de- and will deliver value uh, rather than getting hung up on making robust tests and robust modeling. But however, if you're do if you're working on a critical reporting service, accounting, safety reports, things that where lots of money or, or lives can ma- you know lives change can matter on that data, then you want robust uh, mo- mo- you want robust quality on that. And with modeling, it's sort of like if you're if you know you're going to be end up working on a rather big system that's going to have to scale out, then trying to buy into that modeling early on can reap you much return. So if you can do that, it recommend to do that. So <laughs> I think the, I think the answer it, it, it you, you've got to sort of like take the user requirements and sort of like fit it to what sort of works, and then also build a plan to say right, we're going to come back to that um at a later date if we've proved that x works then we'll go to y and sort of like keep our technical debt down there there is also a monitoring element as well to this so you want to monitor how well your data platforms do it so if it isn't becoming as robust as you want you want to actually concentrate on getting your technical debt down so if you're feeling like you're getting too many errors and people aren't trusting your data platform then you need to get more robustness into that with data quality and if you're feeling that the changes are not be you're not making fast enough change and your data model is holding you back either in performance or how quickly you can make those changes then you may need to look at re- remodeling your data uh to that works better in terms of performance or rate of change so as i'm looking at this and i'm thinking about a data platform and having a strong data foundation in place. One thing that I realize is that before you get a data foundation up and running, it's really hard to talk about doing any kind of AI ML. And I imagine you've seen that a ton. And so how have you felt like there's been success when it comes to bolstering AI ML on top of a data platform? What are some things and design patterns that you potentially have seen that have been useful in that regard? There's a couple of different ways. Like we, we a, a, a common one is you have like, I've seen a completely separate data science team, which has its own pros and cons, uh, which might build out their own ML platform, which is quite common out there. In terms of data platform, um, what I find is, what I find often useful is you you do want that fundamentals in there. So you want to have some trust in your descriptive analytics before you start your inferential analytics. So you can build on top of them with a a solid foundation that uh, you know your pipelines are working, you know the data you're you're outputting is is of of, uh, high enough quality. Um, and that, that sort of makes it easier as you, you sort of like, it's, it's, you're not so much, uh, building the plane while flying it too much with that. Um, it comes back to, I think I mentioned in one of my books, I like the pyramid of hierarchies of, of the data science hierarchy tree, which is fairly common, which is you want to get the, you want to get the, uh, the, the foundational analytics in place before you then start. You want to look. You want to first look back back at your historic data and know that's good before you can move on to start forecasting into the future and start making um, wisdom and knowledge from that. But I have seen some success with like data science teams sort of like go away and creating their own solution and sort of like build their own thing, um, which is kind of interesting. It's sort of it, it's sort of like. It would probably go against uh, most classical data practitioners, which we just talked about, that hierarchy insight. I suppose what that would give them is a bit more autonomy in that. So um, the, there's more de- there's more risk in them get, of getting the wrong outputs because they don't know the data as, as well. And they're not on the, based on less solid foundations, but they have more autonomy to work and sort of like build fast, which can be quite useful when you're just trying to get something out quickly. Yeah, that that's interesting because it does feel like there is a very strong tendency for companies once they hit a certain maturity to have the data platform team, the ML platform team, and then almost like the data scientists are the 
users of the ML platform and it's like they're the customers for the ML platform team. And so the ML platform team goes and they are making sure that those data scientists are are taken care of and getting what they're needing. Yeah, um, which can be... Uh... We, I think I think we haven't fully. I don't think the the community at large has actually pro- properly figured that out as well. This is quite a, um, uh, be, and it can be quite tricky because data access is one thing. I know the co- the common one is data scientists want access to the raw data, which can be a whole minefield to get through for political purposes because that data might be extremely sensitive for whatever reason. Uh, and they're, they're very wor- and companies are very worried to getting it out there. Um, but there's uh, there's also the case of I think that sometimes it can be sometimes people go too early to the raw data, thinking that uh, that, that they can just use the raw data and figure it out themselves. When actually you need to step back a bit, have a look at the business logic of what the an analytics team have created, and then sort of be able to apply that to your um uh, mod machine learning models um if that makes sense uh so it's, so yeah. you're not trying to run you're sort of not trying to run before you can walk and sort of like fully understand your data estate and the dom- your domain you're in before you start um just hacking the raw data because you can end up wasting so much time just trying to recreate what the business intelligence team has already created um because it's quite common to create features that are very similar to what uh, a KPI is, basically. You know, you, your models can end up just being a collection of KPIs. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so don't reinvent the wheel. If you are looking for features, maybe the BI team has already created them with a KPI. Yeah, so uh, it's, it's one thing. I, I try, to, try to look at the existing work done so far rather than new things just to try to find those low effort high value things when building when feature engineering um rather than trying to create your own complex uh calculations just to create a feature try it try and find the low hanging fruit in that sort of sense wow okay then wow okay yeah i hadn't thought about that but that feels like i trust your opinion on it i think that it feels right you know (laughs) I don't know how controversial that uh, assumption is, to be fair. Um, but I had I, I even came across one blog a few years back where someone was sort of like, whether there, there might be some future where we're both where both business analysts and data scientists are using feature stores, which might be a very, I think it's not something really done, so it's very controversial. But if you know where, because at the end of the day, you're building. You're trying to build interest and insights either via features or uh, KPIs, and it, it maybe is feature stores the one place where uh, data scientists and business analysts can come together. Are we just calling the same thing by different names when you have an analyst calling it a KPI and you have a data scientist calling it a feature, but the root of it is is really the same? Yeah, it can be. I, as I say, there are times when it can be different in terms of... Um, because it can be, it, it is, it can definitely be expressed differently in the outputs. Because a model prefer, you know, a model wants, you know, wants integers preferably in their matrix or decimal numbers. They don't want text, whereas business intelligence end users want text. So there, there are sometimes differences like that. Because you know, an end user will want, uh, say, you know, a traffic light report where they want green, red, amber, but a model will want one, two, three. And it's it, you know, or zero, one, two, or something like that. Yeah. And one thing that I think both ML and data engineers can agree on is they have a shit ton of pipelines happening uh, all over the place. Like pipelines are just the go to. And we talked a little bit about airflow before we hit record. Uh, and we've had a lot of people on here to talk about for ml how airflow quickly can be a bit of a mess and so it might not be the best choice i'm interested to hear your take a like data pipelines what do you see them as when it comes to the data platform how do you look at them and then b like how do those then 
feed data into the ML platform and what does that synergy look like? Um, I think it, it can be, uh, yeah, I, I can definitely see how um, Airflow can run out of scale, especially for ML, because it can, Airf, uh, Airflow is its basic element, is creating a DAG and it, and ML almost like, so likes to create a, like a lovely loop of, you know, you get your output data. A lot of ML um, algorithms like to create that loop of where it's almost doing a force feedback, you could say like, so, uh, and it does, it, it is actually quite painful. It can be quite painful to scale as well to, uh, in terms of managing and it's sort of, and it, I can imagine some days so I just want to get away from managing an airflow pipeline rather than, you know, they want to be building new features, making their model better, getting more insights for their customers rather than managing an airflow instance. Um, I, I know there's. The, there is sort of more sort of interesting alternatives that might suit um, data scientists. Uh, the sort of like I know this uh, cube flow, which is sort of like more aimed at ML. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a there's a ton, right? There's cube flow, there's flight, there's Zen ML, there is, and then there's the data engineering ones you've got like mage and dagster and prefect and all that fun stuff so there's a plethora of them yeah i i think prefect for example because i've used that in the past as well that was that works much better for uh, ml because it's a bit more flexible uh the api is easier it's easy to it's sort of like it's it's, it's had some, it's it's a it's very much a system that sort of like has tried to learn from uh, Air, Airflow and some limits and Airflow itself has sort of like done that a bit it's sort of like I think people haven't realized it has been upgraded a bit over the last few years it's, it is again it, it can really depend because you can use it you can get away with using Airflow to a certain extent depending on what how many you know how many models you want to produce and uh, what kind of models you want to produce if, it, if you are if you're not feeding the data back to the start it's much easier to uh, to build a pipeline because as i say a, a, a da, it's all about building di a directed acyclic graph you know dag and they and they prefer to just go one way they don't want to be doing things like looping back on themselves yeah that's a great point well jake this has been awesome man i appreciate you coming on here and teaching me a little bit more about data platforms and of course 2024 it's all about them data engineers i'm going to call it right now we're in january we're going to be hearing a lot more about how vital it is especially as these llm projects run up again the data problems and they're going to be calling in the data engineers all over the place yeah yeah i've heard it's sort of like uh there's a lot of talk about intelligent data platforms which is sort of like mixing uh, generative ai and uh, ml and data so in, all into one place so they're almost sort of like a symbiotic relationship where you're using the you're using you're using ai to make your data platform better but you're also using your data platform to make better ai and ml yeah you see a lot of text to sql large language models coming out because of that so we'll see hopefully there's it looks promising it seems exciting let's see where the future takes us huh yes just make sure you have the right data for it have high quality robust data for it <laughs> This is Skylar. I lead machine learning at Health Rhythms. If you want to stay on top of everything happening in MLOps, subscribe to this podcast now. 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 now.